All right. Well, hi, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. I just want to say uh, welcome to the 2022 to 2023 Humankind series at West Shore Community College. Um, my name is Megan Sponhauer. For you guys, for anyone who doesn't know me, I teach in the nursing department at West Shore, um, and I'm really excited to be involved in today's event. So if you don't know what our Humankind series is at West Shore, this is our um, cultural arts and lecture series that we do every year. So this series includes events like today's panel, which focuses on a more specific topic. But in the past, we've also had uh, lectures by outside speakers. We also have included things like musical performances and different art exhibits and even feature films. So this is our sixth year doing the Humankind series at West Shore. And this year, the topic that we are focusing on is um, centered around the future of work. So for us today, specifically, we're looking at and wondering um, kind of about the question, like what is the future of working in healthcare? Um, and what might that look like for those of us already working in healthcare and those of us who are students um, going into a career in healthcare? So kind of as a little bit of background, um, looking toward the future of working in healthcare, it's really important for us to ask this question about what the future might look like just because of huge changes that have already been taking place in recent years. So everything from advances in medical technology overall, which has led to shortened hospital stays for patients, um, to things like the electronic health record, to the rise in travel jobs for those working in healthcare. Um, and then even, of course, we all know the tremendous impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic over the past couple of years. So it's pretty safe to say that healthcare is always changing and that as healthcare workers, we must always be adapting to what those changes are. So today's event is gonna involve a panel discussion uh, with four different individuals who work in different aspects of healthcare. And all of them are going to share with us their experience and their perspective on the future of working in healthcare. So I'm going to briefly introduce them to you right now. Um, well, first, we have Rebecca Valco. So she is a clinical nurse leader at Trinity Health St. Mary's in Grand Rapids on the cardiac, vascular, and transplant unit. So Rebecca has a master's degree in nursing, and she's also certified in progressive care nursing. Jacob Mardig, he's a senior EPIC consultant. He primarily works uh, remotely right now, so he's joining us today from Florida. Um, needs to send us some sunshine this way, but he has a bachelor's degree in health information management and systems from The Ohio State University. We also have Malia Mariani. She's the chief nursing officer for Corwell Health Ludington, formerly known as um, Spectrum Health Ludington Hospital. So her education includes a doctorate degree in nursing from Baylor University. And then we also have Dan Yost with us today. So he's coming from here at West Shore Community College. Um, Dan is a paramedic and he's the director of our EMS and fire programs here at West Shore. So he's gonna be bringing us his perspective from that area of healthcare as well. So our format that we'll be uh, using for our panel discussion today is that each of our panelists is gonna provide a short presentation about 10 minutes each, and then that's going to leave us some time at the end of the hour for some questions and answers. So I highly encourage you guys to ask questions to our panelists while we have them here. Um, if you do have questions, I would ask that you post those in the chat box on your screen. So you should see the chat box option coming up at the bottom of your screen on the webinar. Um, that's going to be the best way to submit those questions. So if you go ahead and type your questions in there, that way at the end of the hour, I can look through those and share questions with the panelists. So I'd appreciate any questions from you guys. I would also like everyone to be aware that the presentation is being recorded and it will be available on the West Shore Humankind page if you want to review any of the information or go back and listen again. Okay. So with that, we have our first presenter. So Rebecca Valco, uh, like I mentioned, she is a clinical nurse leader at Trinity Health St. Mary's in Grand Rapids. She's been a nurse for 26 years and a clinical nurse leader for the last 12 of those years. Um, she's part of the first group of clinical nurse leaders in Michigan. So a clinical nurse leader, also known as a CNL, uh, is a master's prepared nurse who looks at patient outcomes, implements evidence-based care, and drives improvements in patient safety. 
and nursing processes on their unit. So she's gonna share more with us about what the clinical nurse leader does and kind of the response of the clinical nurse leader to recent changes in healthcare. So welcome, Rebecca. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, of course, I could talk about an, uh, um, about all this for about an hour, so um, this is tough to shorten it down. You can hear me okay? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Excellent, awesome. So yeah, so I am a clinical nurse leader, and um, uh, yes, and we, I, again, as Megan said, we're I'm at Trinity Health um, down here in Grand Rapids. So the overview, kind of as Megan shared, is a master's educated nurse, and um, we are really prepared for the whole continuum of care. Most of the CNLs in the nation are in um, acute care, but there's definitely room for um, CNLs all over the continuum of care. And really we were put in place and started just because of the changing healthcare environment. We do, um, our competencies are um, through the American Association of Colleges of Nursing, and we align with the essential of masters of education in nursing. So uh, they, a couple of years ago, took a look at this, our, any masters prepared nurse and tried to align them. So we are pretty closely aligned with uh, uh, clinical nurse specialists um, with some differences. And um, just the latest number that I could pull, we have about 2,500 practicing CNLs nationwide. So background, introduced in 2003, this was the first new nursing role in over 35 years, and it really was called to adjust that change in healthcare. As we, um, like I said, we've got to continue to adapt. Um, in 2007, the white paper was approved for that clinical nurse leader to begin. I believe I was a educator at the point, um, at that point where it came uh, that our Trinity Health, or at the time it was St. Mary's, was going to host a cohort of 17 of us. And um, it was, I think, probably about 2008. And um, none of us knew exactly what it was going to be, but uh, I knew it was going to be pretty amazing and pretty special. So we definitely, um, so I kind of left on. We graduated in actually 2010. We were, as Megan said, the first cohort in Michigan. So that was pretty excited to kind of lead that uh, role. So um, we are, you know, one of the leaders in the healthcare delivery system. We practice against our, through the variety of settings. We are not an administrator or a management. So most CNL should never have direct reports. They're not a manager. They're clearly aligned, uh, working very closely with the manager. Um, we really assume accountability for the outcome. So anything, especially on my unit, I own all the nursing sensitive um, outcomes. So falls, uh, pressure injuries, uh, central line infections, and then work really closely with the staff uh, for any evidence-based um, processes. So pretty much I kind of explained to new people that your manager is your people person, they handle your paycheck, your schedule, I'm process. And I really focus on especially process and then complex care management, I would say um, really has come to light in those last couple of years. And we're really at the point of care. A lot of this role was keeping those expert nurses, as you know, expert nurses, after they are in nursing, they um, move on, they get degrees, and they continue to different roles. But this really, the point is keeping experienced um, expert nurses at the point of care. I think most of, probably I'd say 25% of my role is educating and mentoring staff at the bedside. Um, so, you know, it's, it's definitely, definitely fulfilling that role. So these are the fundamentals, lots of words, lots of competencies, but I did kind of bold, I think what really pulls us out from other roles in nursing, because people are confused on what does, what do you do compared to a CNS or an educator or a manager? We really are working with those care outcomes and we are um, looking at kind of anything that happens at the point of care. Um, risk anticipation is a huge one. It's funny, we all talk about once you kind of go through your CNL, um, classes and the program, you you have this different lens. You look at things very differently. You'll never go to a bathroom again and um, look at it the same way because you're looking for process efficiency. Does this make sense? Um, lateral integration. I use most most of my day is speaking and talking with all different um, providers, interdisciplinary team, patients, families. So really just making sure that we're connecting them and making sure that we're staying on the same page. 
And again, that leadership aspect, I am part of the leadership team on my unit, but also um, part of that interdisciplinary team. So that kind of highlights just a little bit different. Um, what led to the role, again, that 1999 Institute of Medicine report that uh, airs human, as we all, um, I'm sure most of us know about, just, you know, abysmal um, patient deaths and outcomes. So really just looking at what can we do to kind of make sure that we have um, seamless care and we are using much more efficient, we're working on costs, um, and then really just bringing the whole team together. Um, outcomes, as I kind of said, most of my figure, uh, most of my uh, focus is on those outcomes. So anything, so but you know, behind say just falls in general. Um, you know, we have probably five to ten different interventions that I'm looking for every single day on every single patient. So I'm um, working with the staff and making sure that those are in place, making sure that we're keeping our patients um, safe. Um, again, we continue to look at documentation is always a huge thing, as you know, as my epic friend probably could uh, tell you that, um, you know, that the EMR is definitely um, is great for some things, but it definitely has brought some um, difficulties with um, with communication and just efficiencies. So, of course, working with the staff, I'm pretty much their kind of point person to work with our informatics team to help improve um, workflows. Um, and then patient experience where I'm working with the whole team, really trying to meet with those patients and their families to making sure that they're having a good experience, also safe experience, high quality experience. And I, I find too, that I was just telling a new nurse and when I was explaining my role, I really like to um, focus on that art of nursing, kind of that back to basics of, you know, why did you become a nurse and how to share that? Because many times in the busyness, we sometimes forget that. So I'm kind of that whispering in their ear. I feel that, you know, the amazing thing about being a nurse and what they bring to the table. Um, just a day in my life. This is kind of, you know, I come in, um, just review the patients for the day, get ready for rounds. We have our rounds at 10 o'clock, usually about an hour. Um, unfortunately, we have so many different providers up here. We don't have providers um, at our rounds. So sometimes I'm that communication point with that nurse, with that provider. But really looking at that big picture and trying to move that plan of care along. If patients have been here for several days, looking at those barriers to discharge. And that's something that I call out pretty much in, in rounds, um, what is keeping the patient here. So we're all on the same page. We all understand our role to help getting that patient discharged and um, you know how we can do better if anything. And I, and I said kind of um, before that risk anticipator, I mean, I always have those kind of bubbles popping up in my head of, oh, you know, they're confused. So we gotta be careful that they, um, you know, have all the fall precautions. They're not eating, they're, have, um, they're elderly. You know, what are those other things that we are, um, that we can do to keep this patient safe? Um, complex case involvement, as you guys can imagine, super complex cases. We have patients living at our hospital that um, without any discharge plan. So how can we care for them in a safe and um, the best way possible, but also move along their care and figure out what, um, working with the discharge planners, what our options are. Um, leader rounding, part of that leadership team, we do a uh, round in all the uh, patients and families just to kind of meet them and make sure that they're, we're addressing any concerns they have. And then unit process, quality projects. I work with um, our, um, our unit-based council um, and anything you know with that. And then also we are involved in some hospital-wide projects. Um, me personally, some heart failure work, workplace violence, um, restraints, so using kind of our, um, our expertise, our lens for those house, those um, housewide projects. So a little bit mostly on the unit, but we do are utilized in those hospital projects. And I like to talk about customers wise, there's, I have three customers, you know, patient families, our, my staff, and then providers. So on a given day, I kind of, um, it may, all looks different, no day is the same. But um, really trying to figure out, you know, how to make the workflow of the, the staff, providers, and the experience of the patient and the family, um, you know, all high quality and safe while they're here. And that's it. All 
All right. Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, it's super just interesting to hear how the clinical nurse leader uh, can really make a difference on the unit and looking especially like at that patient safety and just kind of like integrating care together and all those different aspects. So thank you. Um, next up, we have Jacob Mardik. So like I said, he's a senior EPIC consultant. So for those of you guys who um, don't know or maybe don't work with EPIC at all, EPIC is one of the um, electronic health records that we'll see in the hospital. So a lot of like our nursing students who are doing clinicals and facilities in this area um, will be working with EPIC um, as they do nursing clinicals. So Jacob works on projects that are really applicable to some of these trends and changes in healthcare that we're talking about today. So specifically, he's done a lot of work on things around like virtual health and patient involvement in their care. So like I said, kind of unique about his current position is that he, for the most part, works remotely. Um, he is from Northeast Ohio, but coming to us today from Florida, where he is for the winter. Um, so like I said, we're all jealous that you're in Florida, but uh, welcome, Jacob. Um, we're excited to hear what you have to say about healthcare information technology. Thanks, Megan. Um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, like Megan stated, my name is Jacob Mardig. Uh, I am a senior EPIC consultant uh, working for Oxford Health IT and I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about healthcare, uh, IT, and and my role within within it. Uh, yeah, so a little bit about myself and and my background. Um, I majored in uh, a degree called Health Information Management Systems at Ohio State University, and and really this degree encompasses a lot of uh, a general background really within healthcare and. Uh, provided things from anywhere from revenue cycle management to database management to privacy and security, and uh, kind of led me into the the healthcare IT realm. My my first job out of college, I I worked as what's called an implementation specialist of a different kind of healthcare or health IT software called NextGen. And one of the main projects that I did at the time was. I worked uh, and traveled all over the country, implementing NextGen in uh, a multitude of Venus access centers um, all over. And uh, really, uh, that job taught me a lot. And I worked, you know, hands-on with providers and staff, and actually implementing that in in small individual uh, access centers. Um, it was kind of a, a cool job, but but also a, a learning experience for me too. Uh, from there, uh, I worked as uh, clinical application analyst for Wellmont Health System now called Ballot Healthcare in in North Northeast Tennessee, and this is where I got uh, my start in Epic. And for the last uh, about six seven years now, I've worked as a uh, Epic consultant with Epic Systems. Uh, Epic Systems, as Megan stated, is is what's called an integrated electronic health record system. It is uh, used, according to Epic, that is used at, or 300 million uh, people across the world have an Epic health record. Um, and actually within a multitude of, of healthcare system, again, across the world, there are, uh, I think local to Michigan, Trinity and Corwell both use Epic, but some of the bigger names in healthcare, Mayo, Cleveland Clinic, Kaiser Permanente, they all, all use Epic. It's, it's one of the, the biggest players um, in, in the EHR space. Uh, what, what I work primarily with is a, a product called MyChart, which is considered a patient portal. And really what a patient portal is, is it's either an app or a website as you as a patient can log into and view test results. You can message your provider. You can view um, really your health information. It allows for patients to take a take a, an integral part of of their care and really get involved, it, it's kind of that gateway uh, to to really a, a multitude of different things. Uh, my work as a consultant has been primarily with uh, the client Co Children's Healthcare System in Fort Worth, Texas. It's a pediatric hospital system, and I was actually involved with the initial implementation of Epic there and. And what that pretty much just means is they they had two different systems. They had one system for their inpatient side and they had another system for their outpatient side. And what we did was we eliminated both of those and went with Epic across the entire system. So that 
pretty much means using it ambulatory, inpatient, billing, everything is involved in one system. And what this is allows is a continuity of care uh, across the entire system, making sure that that information is available uh, where and when it's needed. Uh, more recently with Co-Children's, my role has been primarily uh, as a member of the digital experience team. And this, this term digital experience is, is kind of a newer term in, in health IT, but, but it's something that uh, is basically utilizing any sort of newer technologies, whether it be pa uh, patient focused or provider focused, uh, uh, just it's kind of a catch all term that uh, making sure that we have the right uh, the right technology and to incorporate into a patient's care. Uh, next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about changes in healthcare and how they impact my role and what I do in healthcare IT. Uh, one of the big, th as Megan stated um, at the beginning, is there are constant changes in healthcare. It's something that is inevitable and, and various things drive change. Uh, one of these things that we work on or are or, or impacted by is, is really government legislation and regulation. Uh, one, one such recent example of this is the 21st Century Cures Act. And, and what that was, or one portion of that re regulation legislation was a concept called open notes. And, and what open notes uh, really is designed to be is making sure that the the patient has access to uh, their information and the right information through through a patient portal or some some sort of uh, yeah access to that information by some sort of means. Uh, with with open notes, it it was really a challenge in that we had to to make sure that again that that the right access was given, but also that that sensitive information, sensitive notes, sensitive uh, things that would be potentially harmful for the care for the patient were not, were not released. And really this required a, a collaboration between not only IT, but, but clinical and operational leadership to make sure that, that providers and staff and everyone was kind of on board and, and had the correct education. And, and I guess not only the technical build, but but also the the education and and practicality of what was going on was all integrated and in sync. Uh, that's just I guess one example of of projects that that involve uh, everyone across the board. Uh, like Megan stated, uh, one thing that has changed a lot for me from the beginning of of my role is is really the day to day work environment. Uh, I I do similar work, um, but. Where I work has, has changed uh, quite a bit. I, I went from working primarily on site um, in an office uh, to now I work fully remote uh, from home. And uh, I, I have some statistics around remote work. And, and really, when we think about the future of, of work in general and work in healthcare, uh, healthcare IT has been one of the uh, one of the, the jobs and roles that has transitioned sorry about that, has transitioned to the remote sphere. A few, uh, a few statistics that I found interesting uh, more recently is approximately 87% of respondents stated that remote work uh, options improve their overall work-life balance. Another survey in June of 2022 found that eight in 10 people are now working hybrid or remote while only two in 10 are entirely on site. Uh, and uh, another study from, from AT&T also found that a hybrid remote work model was expected to grow from 42% in 2021 to 81% in 2024. Uh, that we're already seeing quite a bit of remote work being accelerated um, really since COVID. The last thing I wanted to share regarding remote work, I found this one even more interesting, is, is that a study done in, in the summer of 2022 found that 65% of respondents reported wanting to rem work remotely completely full time, and then another 32% wanted to have some sort of hybrid work environment. If we if we add those numbers up, that that's almost 97% of people who wanted some sort of form of remote work. I mean, really, this these statistics just indicate 
that that employees are really yearning for for some sort of flexibility and and some sort of hybrid or remote work option. Uh, the last thing again that I found absolutely fascinating was fifty seven percent of respondents uh, said that they would leave their job if their co company did not offer some sort of remote work option. Uh, again, all these things really just point to 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 where healthcare is going. Um, on in the IT space, but but also in other roles as well, and and we see that kind of across the board and in in different industries also. Lastly, uh, impacts and how we plan for the future. Uh, one thing I want to talk about is consumer focused development, and and what that really means is is when we when we think about developing uh, new technologies or new uh, programs or activities. Um, for patients to be able to be involved in their care, we would really want to make sure that that it's not only making their care better, but but also, uh, yeah, it's 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 focused to to really provide not only, I, I guess, a a, a good business uh, model going forward. The one ex such example of of something that we've done recently uh, was at Cook Children's, they opened up a new pedi pediatric hospital. And the one, a few of the products that we worked on that, that were really focused on, on capturing market segment were, were we developed a whole custom mobile application where such activities as uh, food ordering through an app, uh, TV remote done through an app, uh, as well as uh, other sort of inpatient review functions such as you could view test results through this app while you're in the hospital. You could uh, you could message your providers. You can uh, view a daily schedule. All these things, again, really not only trying to, to provide a, an ease of function in a TV remote or something that's nice to have, but, but really, you know, in the end, we're trying to, to, to make for patient better or better care for patients overall. Lastly, I, I wanted to talk about the future of healthcare and, and some of the, uh, I guess, overall um, items that, that really Deloitte, uh, a consulting firm, has, has pulled out as being instrumental in, in the healthcare space going forward. These, these are really, um, they've identified these as being, uh, go, help being as future developments going from treatment-based reactionary care uh, to, to really uh, prevention and well-being going forward. Items such as you know, the top items as data sharing and interoperability, they're, they're currently things that we've already focused on and, and current hot topics. Uh, some of the questions I think going forward for, for health IT that, that will be big is, is how do we provide healthcare providers with the full picture of a patient's health? You're really speaking to, to that data sharing uh, item also, uh, you know, speaking to, to interoperability, how, how do we provide healthcare providers with a full picture of a patient's health? If, if you were to, uh, be from Ohio and then you go to Florida for, for half the year, um, or something like that, uh, you know, making sure that, that their healthcare provider has all the information they need to properly, uh, provide care for you. The, you know, really these again are, are questions that, uh, we in healthcare IT are are trying to provide answers for, and um, yeah, you know, really to sum it all up. Uh, speaking of of change, cha change in healthcare, like I said, is inevitable, but uh, healthcare IT will definitely be a part of of some of the uh, the changes in the future and and shaping what healthcare looks like going forward. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jacob. Yeah, um, I found all those stats that you shared to be really interesting, too. It's going to be, um, I think, just kind of interesting and exciting to see what happens with, you know, hybrid and virtual work over the next few years, especially coming out of the COVID pandemic. Um, just want to remind you guys before Malia starts her presentation, again, if you have questions for any of the presenters to put your questions in the chat box below. Um, as we go so that we can address those at the end. So 
Moving forward here with um, Malia. So Malia Mariani, she's been a nurse for 37 years. She is currently the chief nursing officer at Corwell Health here in Ludington. Uh, so she received her doctorate from Baylor University. She also uh, holds certifications as a nurse executive from the American Nurses Credentialing Center and as a fellow in the American College of Healthcare Executives. So she's gonna share with us some of her thoughts on the future of nursing and healthcare in our area, um, specifically from her perspective at Corwell here in Lunnington. So welcome Malia, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Megan. Um, thanks for inviting me to be on the panel. Um, I think Rebecca said this earlier, uh, we could talk all day about nursing. So I share the same passion that she does. So I'll try to keep it short here, but. Um, can you guys see the slides okay? Yep, okay. All right, um, so I also wanted to tell Jacob, thank you for sharing some sunshine because I'm up in Lennington and I hope wherever everybody is today that they're also experiencing some sunshine, a rare occurrence in uh, this month in, uh, in Michigan. So appreciate uh, sharing that a little bit. But, um, so I'm gonna just talk about basically kind of three very high level um, uh, things that are going on in nursing across the country and really uh, locally as well. And the three things I want to talk about today are um, the nursing shortage, uh, for one, and then really uh, the transformation of healthcare. I think that what uh, Rebecca and Jacob both talked about really um, hit the nail on the head when we talk about transforming our care models and just thinking differently about how we're providing care. And then the last thing I was going to make some comments about is really just um, so how does all that, you know, impact the work of the nurse? Um, what kind of skill sets do you need to have and, and what should you be doing to kind of prepare yourself for um, a career in nursing in the future? So I'm here to tell you the nursing shortage is real. I get asked that question a lot. Is it really a nursing shortage? I mean, I know a lot of nurses. Uh, yeah, it's real. So. Um, depending on which data you look at, if you're looking at the nursing uh, studies or you're looking at some of the labor board studies, you know, you might see a little bit of some variation in the numbers and things like that. But everyone pretty much agrees that, you know, these three things that I have on the slide here are retirement of nurses, the increased demand for nursing and healthcare services in general, um, and the options available to nurses. Those three things are really um, impacting across the nation um, in a very big way. So when we look at retirement, uh, we are not a young profession. The average age of a nurse uh, is 52. In our state, our average age is a little bit younger, 47, 48. Um, and really, right now, 15% of all nurses, and there's about three and a half million of us across the country, about 15% of us are eligible for retirement right now. And many organizations saw nurses over the pandemic uh, retire early. They were thinking, oh, I'm, you know, I might retire in another couple of years. And the pandemic hit and they, and they decided to retire. So um, what is also a little bit concerning is of those 15% that are eligible for retirement now, you think, ooh, how long are they gonna last, right? About half, 41% of them say, I'm gonna do this in the next one to three years. And then if you look out 10 years from now, more than a million nurses, which is about a 25% or so of our entire workforce is eligible for retirement. So this is a big deal. Um, and we've had to look at things differently. What can we do to keep nurses that are, you know, getting on in their careers, um, you know, in the workforce? How can we, you know, 12 hour shifts, <laughs> night shifts, those are things that are not very appealing um, to nurses that are close to retirement. So a lot of creativity uh, that we need to have in, in nursing administration around how to continue to engage those nurses uh, because they take a lot of experience out the door with them, right? We had several at our little hospital here over the pandemic with 30 to 40 years experience. We had two nurses with 40 years of experience retire very close to each other. And while that was great for them and they certainly do deserve the retirement, all I could see is, you know, there's 80 years of nursing experience going out the door. So retirement is a real thing uh, with the nursing shortage. And you couple that with the fact that we're also going into a high demand for nurses, right? So um, the predictions are that, you know, we need about 200,000 new nurses each year right now, today, uh, in 2023, um, 200 new nurses each year 
and that's going to continue to be the man um, into 2031. And primarily the reason for that, not the only reason, but a big reason is us baby boomers. I can say us because I'm a PLN baby boomer. Um, there's 10,000 of us every single day between now and 2030 that reach the age of 65. And there's nothing wrong with being 65. It's going to be great to be 65. Uh, the issue is as we age, our bodies tend to also develop more health problems. And while we learned a lot in the last 10 years about how to improve our health, um, the, the boomer generation, you know, the first three, four, sometimes even the fifth decade of life, we really didn't know all that stuff or we didn't practice it as well as we are doing now. And so, you know, we think about those chronic health conditions, uh, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, those are things that are just, you know, plaguing our nation across, across um, all of our states. And as we age, unfortunately, those things um, become uh, harder to manage. And so um, as, as our population is older and grows in numbers, we're also seeing more complex health concerns. And we're seeing that in the hospital now. Today, the patients that are coming in are really uh, are very ill. And then the third factor here, looking at the nursing shortages, here, this is I call the blessing and the curse, right? Uh, there are a lot of options for nurses, many options many more options that ever existed. During the pandemic, um, we saw a lot of uh, what we would maybe call non-traditional roles or away from the bedside roles, nurses working um, for insurance companies, nurses working for, you know, like a CVS or a Walgreens, you know, that's getting into the healthcare market, um, weight loss programs, medical spas, how about that? Critical care, midnight critical care nurse, you know, one week working at a medical spa the next week. So, you know, great to have the nursing influence in all of these other areas. The reality is it is pulling uh, nurses away from the bedside. And so we have to be able to um, backfill those roles. Uh, Jacob talked about remote work, so I won't go into that, but nurses love remote work as well. Um, and so, you know, that might be something as we look at uh, the retiring nurses, what we can do to kind of balance that. And then travel. I'm sure everybody on the call today has heard about the travel nurses. I think everybody wanted to be a travel nurse wow, big bucks, you know, and they were making a lot of money and they continue to still make a lot of money. And it, it is, um, you know, it is a desirable role for many. What used to keep nurses away from travel was that you had to travel, right? So you might have to go work in Florida when you were in Michigan. Um, not bad in the winter, right? But um, the thing that has really changed with travel and is impacting even some of our remote areas is you don't have to travel that far anymore to travel. So you can be a travel nurse uh, 30 or 40 miles away. In fact, I think during the pandemic, um, we were sharing some nurses. They might leave a position at Mercy and travel and pick up a position through Poor Well Health or vice versa. You know, so nurses were, you don't have to travel as far as, um, as, as you had to in the past. So, you know, this is a big, yeah, what are we going to do? You know, so this is, um, and, and both Rebecca and Jacob talked a little bit about this, transforming the care model. We have to do things differently. Like the old way of things is just not going to not gonna serve us well in the future. Um, and while we say that nurses are change agents and we embrace change, um, you know, patient situations change all the time, right? Historically, physicians and nurses don't really like change. <laughs> so we have really had to transform um, our thought process around how we provide care. Um, I'm sure we've all heard, you know, we're moving away from illness toward wellness. Uh, we, we, in hospitals and ways, we make our money, right, by filling beds with sick people. And so we really need to move more towards looking at those larger populations and what can we do for patients with chronic diagnoses, to help keep them out of the hospital. So population health and managing patients in larger groups to focus on their wellness, keeping them out of the hospital is, is one way that we're transforming care. And then I listed several things there under the standards of care. When I grew up as a nurse quite a while ago, um, we had to wait for the best practices before we changed our standards of care. We had to wait until somebody did maybe a five, 10, maybe longer year research study. And, um, and then it would get published, which would take time and then maybe in a book or a journal. And research, you know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a nurse, so you know, nursing is a science, so definitely value research, and we continue to utilize research. However, when things are looking really good in a research study and patients are improving their outcomes, you know, we now take the best evidence-based best practices that exist, and we start applying them now. 
And some of that has to do with the ability to share information um, and to get those things incorporated into our, thank you very much, Jacob, electronic health records, so that we're all using those best practices because we need those order sets and things like that that help us uh, make sure we're all staying on the same page. And then while we want standards around our care, uh, we also know that going forward, we really need to focus on personalized, individualized care. We have to meet patients where they are. And so we hear about this term, social determinants of health. And you know, while we might uh, say this medication or this therapy um, or this procedure is best for this patient, we have to look and say, can they afford it? Can they maintain it? Uh, do they believe in it? Do they trust it? We really need to know our patients. Uh, there's a lot going out in the world right now. People are really um, looking at life very differently, especially since the pandemic. And so, you know, understanding, um, you know, what somebody's individualized care is all about is very important. We need to make that a priority. And all of that then feeds into health equity, right? Because, you know, giving uh, two people the same thing, that's fair, right? But it might not be equitable because one person may need something different based on their uh, personalized needs. And then the other piece that I wanted to put here, and uh, Jacob talked about this a bit, um, uh, and I think that Rebecca touched on it as well, but we have all of this technology now, right? We used to say, oh, that technology. Now we're like, what, what kind of technology can help us? So managing our health data, very important through the electronic health record. Um, I'm going to venture to say that probably at least 80% of us on this call are wearing some kind of a patient wearable, either your eye watches, your Fitbits, your whatever. Um, that technology is just exploding and it's really, um, it's, it's incredible and it's very valuable. Um, so lots of things that we have to start transforming um, in order to adjust to that. Telemedicine, I think during the pandemic, everybody heard, especially in rural areas, the advantages of being able to come into someone's home and, you know, with telemedicine visit to be able to see a physician on their computer, to see a physician, you know, uh, in the corner of an office somewhere at work for a 15 minute urgent care visit or something on your phone. So um, lots of advances there has have resulted in us really transforming how we do things. And then smart equipment. So I remember when smart pumps came out, those are IV pumps that we could program our medications in. You know, we didn't have to do math anymore. But let me tell you, math is still important because with all of this technology, we still need to have that human element sort of thinking behind it. So um, lots of transformation occurring around um, technological advances. So what does all this mean for nursing? Um, what does the nurse in, in the future look like? Where do we need to focus? Um, I think that uh, Rebecca did an amazing job talking about her role as the clinical nurse leader. Um, so the point I wanted to make here is advanced education and specialty certification. It's, it's critical. We need nurses functioning at the highest level of their licensure. And, you know, the, the technical skill sets that we learn as nurses, starting IVs, drawing blood, giving um, medications, those are, are very important, very necessary, um, and really feed into a lot of the safety around patient care. At the same time, we need to do the critical thinking, the problem solving, the advocating, uh, looking at safety, questioning everything. Um, so we need to continue to advance our education and specialty certification. And, you know, Florence Nightingale said it, said it really well. She said something, her quote was something like, let us never consider ourselves finished nurses. We are lifelong learners. So that's, that's one piece for the future nurse. Um, and also understanding that we are not uh, functioning in isolation. We are part of an interprofessional care team. The complexity of patients these days requires all of our partners to be with us. Nurses and physicians, um, you know, Rebecca spoke about the care rounds. We now have pharmacy. We have uh, the therapies, physical therapy, occupational therapy. We have dietitians. Um, you know, the, the, the team that surrounds the patient is really uh, very, very important. So recognizing that we are not, you know, in isolation. The uh, value equation, a little bit of math here, um, but nurses are going to need to understand this because this, this is the driving force that we're seeing uh, in the healthcare environment right now is that people are paying more out of pocket for their healthcare expenses, right? We, we all have seen that in the last few years, greater access to care, but also, you know, having some skin in the game. And we all want a good value for our money, right? So when we talk about value in healthcare, we have to look at the 
quality, the safety, and the experience divided by sort of what that overall cost is. That's how um, that's how we are rated and um, evaluated through our patients as well as some of the external agencies and, and, and our third party reimbursement. Um, we have to embrace disruptive innovation and change is constant. Um, we, we cannot fight it. Um, it can be very stressful, it can be very hard, but if you look at it as disruptive innovation, it, it's not a bad thing. It might disrupt our work, but it often disrupts it in a good way. Maybe it points us to be more um, efficient, maybe it points us toward uh, better better um, planning for our patients. Uh, the other thing was to be cognizant of our own bias. Uh, many of us are starting to go through like implicit bias training, but as we move towards uh, more personalized care, we need to bring our best to those uh, conversations and those experiences that patients have. So really being aware of our own bias so that we can bring our best every day to our coworkers as well as our patients, very important for the nurse of the future. And this last point that I put on here about the future nurse is, you know what? You're no good to everyone else if you don't take care of yourself. And nurses historically have not been very good at that. So uh, we're getting much better, but there's a lot of focus on work-life balance. Um, and I put this phrase there, choose wisely. Um, that might be a travelocity or something thing, I don't know. But uh, seriously, you guys, if you were to talk to the nurses over the last couple of years about what got us through the pandemic, sure, it was tough. But it was the companies we were working for, and more importantly, the people that we came to work with every single day. And so that's going to be very important for nurses of the future. It is going to be stressful, and it's going to be hard work. So please make sure that you are choosing wisely um, when you choose your specialty areas and um, the teams that you work with. And then I just put this up. Um, I, I was doing some reading um, despite everything. This was a survey that um, was conducted by AMN, AMN Healthcare. 81% of uh, nurses are still very satisfied with their career choice. And the majority of us would encourage others, myself included, <laughs> to um, encourage a career in nursing. And we're still really very honored and proud to be the, um, the most trusted profession that's 20 years in a row. So there's, there was, you know, we're not heroes. Uh, we were touted as heroes during the pandemic. We are human, uh, but we still love what we do. A lot of people are like, oh, you poor thing. Uh, we love what we do. And so it's, a, it's just an amazing career. And we have such an opportunity to impact um, the future of healthcare. So um, I really appreciate the opportunity. I know I talked fast, trying to get a lot here uh, in a very short period of time. Um, but thank you so much for your attention. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Malia. Thanks for sharing all of that information about um, nursing in general. So I especially love what you were saying, um, you know, being in education now, just talking about how it's so important for nurses to, um, you know, keep learning, keep educating yourself because things are always changing. But then, like you said, to choose wisely where you're working and to take care of yourself too. So definitely some great tips for um our nursing students who are just getting started in their nursing career too. Um, so before we move on to Dan's presentation here real quick, I just have a quick update from IT. So it looks like our chat box function is actually not working at the moment. So if you guys have questions, if you wanna actually put those in the Q&A box. So you should see the Q&A box at the bottom of your webinar screen. So if you can submit your questions in the Q&A box, I think that's gonna work for us now. All right, so we're going to move on to Dan Yost, um, our final presenter here. So Dan, again, is the director of EMS and Fire here at West Shore Community College. So with his paramedic experience in the field, Dan has seen a lot of firsthand um, things with how healthcare is changing and how this has impacts on both patients and the healthcare system overall. So Dan, we're really excited to hear your thoughts on the future of work and healthcare from the EMS perspective. So welcome to Dan. Thank you. So yeah, I'm, I'm coming from a different perspective completely out of nursing or IT and all that fun stuff, but um, this is the only slide I have, but I'm going to kind of hit on all of these points here and kind of give a background of really what EMS is, because I do think there's some misnomers of what EMS actually does. Um, so EMS, if you didn't know, stands for Emergency Medical Services. 
Um, and there's multiple levels of EMS. Um, most people consider when they think of a EMS, they think of paramedics and there's more levels than that. Um, but we'll kind of keep it at that level for now. So, but we are integrated into a lot of different venues. Most of us probably think when you think of EMS, you think of public safety, um, you think of fire departments, you think of uh, law enforcement. Um, and really that's a big part of what we do is public safety for one um, and part of that first responder role. Um, but we also ha have a huge role, I think, in healthcare and public health and emergency management and some of those things that we're, we're um, highly intricate in. Um, so our roles are a little bit different than maybe even nursing or a hospital. We're considered a pre-hospital service. So just like nursing and other healthcare professions, um, we also are seeing a major shortage as well. Um, so one local um, EMS agency um, even said that their attrition rates are only at about 20 to 30 percent um, just because people are leaving the profession, going on to either other healthcare things or out of the profession altogether. And there's there's probably multiple things that that leads to that um, EMS. Um, typically, most agencies are running 24 hour shifts. Um, and so the the burnout rate is a little bit higher because of that. And the things that we see out in the public are a little bit um, are hard on people, too. So. Um, some of the things that need to be probably fixed, um, according to the EMS trend survey of 2022, some of the major things that EMS providers were talking about is um, mental health is really one of the big ones, especially coming out of the pandemic. Um, and they say for EMS specifically, um, that suicide rates for EMS providers are one and a half times higher than the general public, um, which is significant. I mean, you, you can pull in law enforcement and fire as well, and all of them are significantly higher than the general public population mainly because of just the things that we see, um, uh, households, uh, vehicle accidents, things of that nature. Um, but more than that, you know, the integration that we have with um, healthcare, I think is huge. And I think that you're gonna see more of that um, down the line. Um, and even the EMS agenda for 2050 um, is outlining some of that more too, that I think you're gonna see a little bit more um, collaborative efforts and training and that kind of thing between um, other healthcare providers and EMS specifically of how we work together and how we can work together better. Um, kind of, I know all the others have mentioned Jacob as well, but I do think that you know his work in uh, electronic uh, healthcare um, records. I think honestly, in and maybe not in a few years, but probably at least um, in the next ten years, I think you're really going to start to see a push for. EMS being able to have access to those electronic care records as well. Um, when we get on scene, we could pull a patient up and, and see really what their record is and, and when the last time they were seen by care providers and that kind of thing, which really would help EMS greatly um, because we go into a lot of situations where we just don't know uh, that patient's background. Um, either A, they can't give it to us because they don't, they're incoherent enough that they can't do that. Um, or they just don't know their own healthcare well enough that they can provide that information. So I do, I do think you're going to see more integration uh, there as well. Um, and so part of, I think, that uh, healthcare and public health and emergency management integration, um, some of the things that EMS does, and I think you're going to see more of it uh, down the road, is when we get on scenes of patients that necessarily don't need to go to the hospital. Um, there's an old adage that I think is slowly starting to die away is when people would call 911, there's an adage that they say is you call, we haul. And I think, I, I firmly believe, and even in my students, I try to push that away a little bit. Um, not every patient probably needs to go to the hospital. Um, sometimes they just might need someone to talk to or, or talk through some things. Um, and I think you're gonna see more and more um, emphasis on what can we do to treat the patient at home. Um, and there are some things already being done with community paramedicine um, or mobile integrated healthcare. And I think that's going to expand and expound a little bit more into even the rural areas. You, you are seeing it more in urban areas, but I think you're going to see more of that, um, which I think will take some of the strain off of um, the hospitals that they're not seeing all of these patients that necessarily don't need to be in their facility. Um, but something that EMS can take care of um, at home. And uh, the other big push that will encourage more of that is where does EMS get their funding? Um, in a lot of cases that I've seen, especially for reimbursements from insurance companies um, or Medicare or Medicaid, 
um, they're woefully underfunded um, for uh, reimbursements. Um, and so a lot of EMS agencies, for one, probably don't pay their, their staff what maybe they should be paid. I think you've seen some in interesting changes in that as well. But And then also other funding. There's some public entities that are funding um, through taxpayer uh, bases. And so some of those agencies, you're seeing a higher uh, pay. And most of the time, you're also seeing retention higher as well. Um, from those agencies because of the, the pay. So I think multiple things are going to mold the EMS over the next few years. Technology is huge. Um, reimbursements is another big one, but integrating all of the uh, community paramedicine to try to take some of the load off of hospitals and that type of thing is gonna be huge as well. Um, EMS is still inherently when somebody calls 911, somebody is responding. So that public safety side of it is still huge. And then the other side of it is that emergency management of how does EMS uh, play a role in that? I mean, hospital staffs um, play a role in emergency management as well, but uh, EMS specifically will integrate a lot with local fire departments, emergency managers of how we mitigate situations, whether it's localized flooding, um, tornadoes, all of that kind of stuff. We play a huge role in how we manage uh, those scenes. Um, because not only do we have to know medical side of things, we have to know how to treat patients and transport patients and um, do what we can there. We also have to have an intricate knowledge of all of the little things. How does the public uh, works uh, department work? You know, what does law enforcement do? What are their roles? You know, what's the fire department's role and what can they help us with or us help them with? So there's a lot more moving parts to it um, than just treating patients. For us, a lot of times um, it's a lot, of, a lot of things on their plate to try to uh, mitigate those situations. Um, and some of it also is just on scene, um, on scene help with patients as well of like, hey, you know what, maybe we should pick up those rugs so you don't trip over them. Um, because this is the fourth time we've done a lift assist in the last week. And so, you know, a lot of that is just public education. And when, when do they call EMS? Um, I know uh, hospitals can attest to this. Sometimes you're like, why did that person come into the ER for a stub toe, right? And so it, and EMS is getting those same types of calls, you know, and it can be just, hey, you know what, maybe if we took this medication or if you took this medication um, regularly, you want to have some of these issues. So some of that on-scene care um, and on-scene education is crucial as well. And I think you're going to see more and more, uh, more and more of a push to train EMS providers in those types of things and probably even incorporate some technology of when we're on a scene of something like that, that we could um, uh, teleconference in with a physician or a nurse and say, hey, this is what we have and save them an ER visit. Let's see if we can fix this um, here on scene. So I do think you're going to see more of that, just more of the integration of EMS in with the rest of healthcare. Um, and I think that's going to be a big part of it. Um, the other I think part of the technology side of it is um, some agencies are already using this type of technology is like uh, handheld uh, ultrasound to be able to test things in the field and see what's going on. Um, I think those are still a, a few years out before they're more prevalent. Um, but even 10, 12 years ago, I remember we weren't able to uh, transmit a 12 lead to a local hospital. Um, now we can do that. And that's uh, alerting cardiologists and alerting ER physicians of Hey, this is what we have out in the field, and this is what we're uh, doing to treat it. And it alerts them to see what we're seeing. And I think you're going to see more of that um, aspect as well of what we can um, integrate techn technologically into that healthcare field as well. Um, other than that, though, I think for the most part, EMS has a bright future. Um, there's still a huge need for EMS personnel. Um, last statistic I read was they need over just a, over a thousand paramedics just in uh, Michigan. That's not counting EMTs or uh, emergency medical responders. Um, I don't know what the national uh, average is right now, but that, that, that's that's huge. And I think that um, over the next few years, you're going to see um, an influx in um, people getting into EMS um, because I do believe it's a great career, just like all of the nursing uh um, feel that their career is great, and I 100% agree. Um, but I do think EMS is a, is a great career um, for certain people, obviously. And um, I think with the increase in pay and increase in some other things, you're going to see a, a more and more people intrigued by what EMS does and how we operate.
Awesome. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, thanks for sharing all of that about EMS. Um, and definitely, you know, I feel like as a nurse, I've spent a little bit of time working in the emergency department too, as so I've seen that um, importance of EMS when they come in, bringing patients into the ER, um, how closely we work with them. But also, uh, I liked that point that you made about technology advancing with EMS too, um, and being able being able to see like what you guys are seeing in the field, you know, coming from that nursing perspective, that was always so helpful to have like a 12 lead EKG sent to us before the patient came in. So it'll be really exciting to see what kind of advances are made in that aspect. So we have a couple questions coming in. I would encourage you guys to keep submitting your questions here in the Q&A box. Um, the first one I have actually is for Dan. So Dan, uh, Amber is asking, she said, and I was wondering the same thing too while you were talking actually. She said, do you think that EMS will be taking on additional mental health crisis calls over time in an effort to reduce acute mental health situations entering the ER. So just wondering if you can speak a little bit to um, the increase in mental health crisis that we've seen the last few years and how that's impacted EMS. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's a great question. I mean, really mental health has, has been, I think, on the forefront of a lot of healthcare, um, especially EMS, um, because we're going on numerous calls almost every day that there's some type of mental health crisis. I, I really don't know if there's any way to get uh, or to keep those patients out of the ER. Um, I do see that um, you're hearing more and more of um, mental health clinics you know, popping up throughout the state. I think they just built one and are building one in Grand Rapids and doing some things like that. I think you're going to see an alternate transport site for EMS that when we get those, instead of going to the ER, you're going to see them just being taken to a, uh, a local clinic um, that specializes in mental health versus the ER. Yeah, definitely. You know, um, that's, you know, something that I've seen working in the emergency department in the past too, is that strain on the hospital system, um, you know, needing those resources for patients who are coming in with a mental health crisis. So um, definitely a huge need. Um, another question we have here, I think, um, Malia, this might be best aimed at you, but I just had a question about whether Corwell Health has any type of like a virtual ICU in the area that collaborates like with the regional ICUs. Wondering if you have any insight into that, what you could tell us about that. Yeah, um, absolutely. I saw that my colleague Nancy Haroon answered um, in there, uh, we do have that. So think about us up in Ludington, you know, close to two hours away from uh, the mothership down in Grand Rapids. <laughs> And so we have, we call it the ICU, virtual ICU. So our intensive care nurses here at Ludington Hospital have access to um, critical care uh, physicians, critical care nurses, uh, pulmonologists. And so it's all done through a camera system. Um, thank you again to Jacob for the electronic health record. When you talk about interoperability, um, devices that interact with, uh, with our EPIC uh, platform, so those providers, those specialty providers um, that are, you know, remote, far away from us can log right in and be part of the patient care team. So absolutely. Yeah, it's huge advancement of technology. It's definitely, um, you know, really major for those patients, especially, you know, in those more rural areas like we are up here. Mm -hmm. Um, just a couple more questions. I have a question for Rebecca, actually. So this is just kind of in terms more of some of those advanced um, nursing roles. So just curious what you would kind of recommend to students who might be interested now in roles like yours, like the CNL or some of those other roles that Malia mentioned, maybe like the clinical nurse specialist or advanced practice, if you have um, any advice for students just kind of getting into nursing right now. Sure. I think, again, I'm, you know, it's hard because I'm kind of an old school nurse. So I think some experience at the bedside is super important, but totally understand that that's not for everyone, which again, that's, that's amazing. But I think too, it's, you know, trying to figure out what your passion is. What do you like about nursing? What part of it? Do you like the education part of nursing? Do you like the clinical? Do you like the medic, you know, the medical standpoint? Do you like pharmacology? 
and um, trying to understand how the human body works, you know, then you might want to go more nurse practitioner. Um, it's really, you know, what you see yourself in. I did go down a nurse practitioner track and um, pretty much had to make that decision of, you know, go time, which track did I want? And I'm like, I don't want to. I, I wanted to stay in the hospital. I, I liked that environment. And um, I did not, um, yeah, decided nurse practitioner wasn't for me. So I think really just talking, shadowing, trying to understand what your um, strengths um, are is really helpful in trying to figure out if that is, um, you know, what, what it is for you. But there, again, there's so many roles now. It is um, so many more more than even today, you know, than I had um, even 10 years ago. I do want to add to Malia, um, though, the whole ICU, it is very interesting. So, you know, I'm, we're down here. Um, St. Mary's is a large hospital, but um, there is conversation because, as Malia was talking about, was the nursing shortage, that if there's not enough bedside nurses, what do we do? If truly people aren't, or nurses are not coming to the bedside or want to work at the bedside, what do you do? You've got to rethink your, um, you know, what does that team look like? So there is discussion, and I believe there is a Trinity Hospital that is using kind of a virtual nurse. So I'm not sure if the end point is the, patient, the nurses are able to take more patients in order to accommodate that, but that virtual nurse is kind of that overseer. They actually can do, um, with the right technology, they'd be able to do education with the patient. They'd be able to um, kind of... Um, you know, be that second person, that second nurse reassuring them or talking them through some things to let that bedside nurse have some extra time. So I know that's kind of, it's still early in the talks and I'm not sure what that would look like, but um, there's definitely, and I think that also puts that role of that, you know, close to retirement nurse, they're not ready to retire, but what, how can they use their gifts and talents? Um, they don't have to do the physical work, but their their mind and their you know their forty years of experience is still there. So how do they support the younger um, nurses? So I think there's some exciting. It'll be really interesting what it looks like, and I think we just have to be open minded to um, what that you know what the possibilities are. Yeah, definitely, and that definitely ties into also kind of with what you know Jacob was talking about with working virtually. It would be um, yeah exciting to see kind of how things play out in terms of that, how that could change some nursing careers. Um, yeah, definitely will be interesting to see in the next few years. So another question, Rebecca, for you while we have you is, um, did you have to have a bachelor's degree for your position? And we said you have a master's degree for your position. Correct. So there's actually a, uh, several tracks that you can get your CNL um, license in. So I was a bedside nurse with my bachelor's for eight years and then went back for my master's. There are a couple of tracks that you can actually go in right from the beginning of um, your schooling and go right through your CNL. So you end up with a bachelor's and the CNL by the end. Um, obviously it's a longer program, um, or you can be kind of like a second degree um, student and do that accelerated program. So different universities have different programs. But um, yeah, I, um, I started it with my bachelor's and um, then, you know, eight years later got my um, master's. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, if any of you guys have questions for Rebecca about that, um, you know, she's left us her email for any questions, but I would add to that too, that um, I have the same certification as Rebecca with that master's degree as a clinical nurse leader. I just not working in that role. I'm working in education instead. So if any of you nursing students have questions, Rebecca and I are both happy to help you and um, guide you in terms of um, furthering your nursing education too, whether that's a bachelor's degree or someday a master's degree too. So always happy to answer questions for you about that. Um, I just have one last question uh, for Jacob. And then if we don't get any more questions, we'll probably wrap up. Um, so if you guys have any last questions to submit, go ahead and submit those right now. Um, but Jacob, I think my question for you is just, you know, you touched on this a little bit, but I'm just curious, you know, with your remote work, especially, um, are there any other um, healthcare professions that you are in contact with frequently that you know work on a lot of these types of applications that you're working on, or do you feel like it's mostly people who are specialized in um, information systems, or do you see like you know nursing or other disciplines um, working on no, this too? That's a that's a great question, Megan. I 
I think actually a lot of the my coworkers are have a nursing background, uh, and and it's extremely valuable uh, for for us on the IT side. It it really is because we're working with clinical applications. It's essential that we engage people who are experts in the clinical field. So uh, I actually have a few different coworkers who who started at the bedside in in that same in co children's and 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 working there and uh, one one individual, she started the bedside and then became an educator and, and now is working in IT. And, and she's kind of an example of, of someone who held a different role, but each one of those roles really uh, leads uh, to some expertise that, that we can rely on in IT. And, and, and she does a great job in, in really utilizing what she's learned along the way to, to make for um, better IT solutions uh, going forward, I, I, again. Just can't emphasize enough that it, it really takes for IT or really anything. It really takes people of all backgrounds to to come together to to make for a, a great solution. And and we really try to 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 work as a team to 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 create those that again make patient care better. Yeah, definitely. So if it's something that you know you're interested in, is that informatic side of things as a nurse, it's definitely something that you have opportunities to get into as well. Okay, one more question here um, coming from Tabitha. Do you think it makes a difference if you get your CNA first and then your LPN and so on? Um, so this might be a good question uh, maybe for Malia, thinking about students who start maybe um, like as a CNA in a hospital um, and then kind of working their way up through their education as a nurse. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Tabitha, for asking that. Um, similar to what Rebecca was saying, I think whatever it takes, whatever is making sense to you at the time, um, you know, sometimes uh, what's going on in our lives is a little bit crazy. And so if it, if it works better to work through and get, um, you know, a shorter amount of schooling and a certificate or a license or something, just stay the course, do what works for you. Um, and you know, if, if have your end goal in sight, um, and as, as Rebecca said, if you can do some shadowing and just as much exposure as you as you can, but um, if that's what works, you just stay that path and and, uh, and and go that route. I was a student nurse before I was been a nurse since I was about four years old, I think, in some capacity or another. So I did the whole gamut. I, I didn't do an LPN, but I was a handy striper volunteer and then became a, a nursing assistant and then a student nurse assistant and then an RN, bachelor's degree, MSN, DNP. So lifelong learner here. So everybody's path takes a little bit, you know, you got to do your own course, but uh, definitely just stay on the path and keep yourself working in, in healthcare and you'll get to where you need to get to. Yeah, definitely. I agree a hundred percent, you know, anywhere you need to start and, you know, just keep keep working hard um, and it will pay off. So um, that looks like all the questions that we have for now. So I'm gonna wrap up. I just wanna thank all of you for joining us, all of our panelists. Um, we really appreciate you being here and sharing your expertise with us and with the students. And thank you to everybody who has attended the webinar and you know, asked questions and been involved. I think you know, this has been really informative and really helpful for a lot of our students. So with that, kind of as we close, I do want to just mention our um, upcoming Humankind events as well. So our next Humankind event is going to be another virtual panel like this one. Uh, the next one is titled, I Quit, The Great Resignation and the Future of Labor Markets. So a little bit of a different take than healthcare, but also will be uh, really informative. So that's on February 23rd at 7 o'clock p.m. If anybody wants to join and listen in to that one as well. So you can also see a full listing of all of our humankind events on the West Shore Community College website. Uh, once you get to the website, you're just going to choose humankind under the community drop down menu. And then you can choose and kind of browse through all of the events that we have going on. 
So one more favor to ask of everybody as you leave the Zoom webinar today, you're gonna to be asked to complete a survey, which is gonna let you comment on the quality of this presentation. So this is really helpful for us. It's really important for us to get feedback from everybody. So just let us know what you liked about this presentation and then you know any opportunities that we could implement to improve the experience for the attendees as well would be really helpful for us. So I just wanna thank you guys again today for joining us as part of Humankind at West Shore. Um, and I hope that everybody um, has a good night and take care.